Um, good morning, everyone. Um, we're here to talk about a very different topic. Uh, we're not going to be in Afghanistan at all or Pakistan. Uh, we're actually going to the Bronx, uh, where uh, a number of us work in a bail reform program called Supervised Release. Um, and it's a, it's a relatively new initiative uh, that was begun uh, in the mayor's office for the mayor's office of criminal justice, Mayor uh, Bill de Blasio. Um, so I just wanted to sort of describe for you quickly what, what we're planning on doing. So uh, I'm going to do a little video uh, introduction to, uh, to the program. We're going to watch a video uh, about uh, supervised release. Um, and we have um, a couple of uh, folks here that work with me. Uh, Tracy Page it works in court operations. Uh, Rosa Aguirre is my colleague in the case management of the supervised uh, release releasees. And uh, Jamal Anderson is one of our graduates from our supervised release program. Uh, we're very happy to be here. I would like to hear, I mean, uh, at the end we're going to do some questions. Uh, we'll, see if you have any questions about what we've described or other sort of related issues. Uh, but first, um, I wanted to uh, show a relatively quick video uh, of some of the folks that have gotten involved in the criminal justice system and their uh, struggles to remain free. I felt scared, of course. It was my first time in Rikers Island. I already heard the horror stories. My name is Ronaldo Hay, and I'm 46 years old. I had a high bail, and my family was impoverished, and I was unable to pay my bail. So I stayed on Rikers Island for a long period of time, approximately six months, and I decided to take a plea bargain. And it wasn't just the violence. It was poor medical conditions. Not only was I feeling the pain and the discomfort, but also my family was. Like, coming to see me visitation-wise, it was eight hours to come to get there, and only for a one-hour visit. There's no bond for a $1,000 bail or less. A $1,000 bail can ultimately feed a family of three or four for two months. So their family are already under the impoverished line, and it's a, ultimately you're going to take the time rather than your family going hungry. I think this is the biggest event in my life. Uh, my name is Adarmis. Uh, I'm 53 years old. I had never in my life stepped into a police prison. Never. I don't know what was jail. I don't know what was prison. I don't know what was going through police system. The bill in my case was $75,000, which is like a huge a giant amount for my brothers to, to put it together, that's a lot of money. How, how are we gonna do that? We cannot get that money. My name is Ali, and Adarmis is my brother. When we saw the judge the first time in court, and we heard about a bill uh, for $75,000, uh, we thought that, you know, who do we, he killed. What, 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 what is involved with this? Because they're asking for a $75,000 bill uh, for my brother. And we are all hardworking people and minority people that are trying to survive in the United States, and especially, uh, uh, particularly in, in New York City. We went to bail bond offices that deal with arrangement for that. We found that bail bond is just for a specific group of people and not for everyone. How they ask for valuable properties. Uh, 
like uh, houses, businesses, valuable uh, properties that not everybody has. And we had to knock doors that we never imagined we had to do and uh, ask people for a favor because uh, we all understood and we all know that uh, my brother deserved to be out of the place. I spent two months in jail For me, it was, I can't describe it, how, how hard it was for me to, to be in that situation. So uh, after I spent two months in jail, uh, I went in front of the new judge. He uh, mentioned about the, uh, bringing down the, uh, the amount of money for bail. When the judge reduced the bill, it was a partially secured bond. And that was when we got our brother, you know, my brother, uh, out of the system. If I wasn't uh, able to make bail, I think it was, uh, if the way I, I, I would see it, uh, it would be a catastrophic situation for me and for my family because for some reason they, I am the baby for them. <laughs> somebody from the program they interviewed me to see if I was eligible they just asked me like where am I primarily staying at I gave her my mom's information she was calling the house phone at first I gave her the house number she wasn't picking up so that was concerning she's like I really need her like to like pick up the phone and you know agree that you know that she knows that you in this program and that we need to call her in her case stop by the house and look for you know regular stuff like that so I gave her the cell phone number and my mom picked up and she was like, ah, you know, and she told my mom like what the situation was and what, you know, what predicament I was in. And she was like, all right, you guys have my information. And that was it. And then right there, we just got to signing the paperwork and then I was on my way to this program. I think without my mom picking up that phone or something, it probably would have been a whole different situation, actually. Yeah, that phone call did it. And I was eligible, so I didn't have to, you know, I didn't have to pay no bail. I was released the same day. I got set up with a case manager. He referred me to a, you know, the Employment Works program. He helped me get a resume. Because not only does it help you with you know your legal issues, it helps you with other things outside from that. I, you know, helped me get health insurance too. I just recently applied for health insurance. Um, I believe it was yesterday. I applied for health insurance, so that's good. You know, I thought I was just gonna get locked up, like just incarcerated until you know, my next court day and I see what happens with the case. I was scared. I felt scared, of course. It was my first time in Rikers Island. I already heard the horror stories. My name is Ronaldo and I'm for So we work for, um, <clears throat> an organization. I had a high bail and my family was impoverished and I was unable to pay my bail. So I stayed on Rikers Island for a long period of time, approximately six months. I am not technologically savvy. It hasn't been mentioned. Sorry. So we work for an agency uh, in uh, New York City called the Center for Court Innovation. Um, and it started back in 1993 with the first uh, community court in the nation uh, called the Midtown Community Court. Uh, it was an effort to sort of 
see if there were other options that judges might have rather than just jail. Um, are there services we can plug in if somebody comes in with a drug problem? What's the benefit to sending them to jail? Uh, if it's a nonviolent crime, uh, wouldn't they do better with uh, treatment as an alternative? Um, and so all of this was based on Janet Reno's uh, court back uh, in, the, in the 80s um, and early 90s, the Miami Drug Court. So we took a lot of those principles and we sort of expanded it to uh, include uh, other specialized courts. So the, the Midtown Community Court, and now there's a number of uh, community courts around the country. You probably have heard of drug courts, and they're very popular now, uh, thankfully. Um, all sort of based on the principles that were learned uh, in Miami and at the Midtown T Community Court. So the chief judge back in uh, 96 said, can you take these principles and apply them to different courts, uh, both in New York City but also in New York State? And the center, in fact, has gone on to uh, consult with other jurisdictions <coughs> um, around the country and as well as around the world. So we, we, uh, we have a court in, uh, in London. We have uh, courts that we've helped uh, set up in Australia, in South Africa. All of it because there's a, a real, uh, clearly a need for the criminal justice system, not just in New York or in New York State, uh, but around the world to improve outcomes that make more sense for folks that get uh, arrested and um, potentially incarcerated. <clears throat> um, so the supervised release program uh, began back in March of 2016. So we've been operating now for a little over a year and a half. Uh, we have incredible success. In fact, the numbers that they were predicting that we might get. And so those are, those are folks that are coming out of arraignments. And so would the judge refer people to us or would, uh, are, there, are there folks that might get uh, into a supervised release program. So what does that mean? So supervised release means that as an alternative to paying bail, we agree to supervise them. And Tracy and Rose are going to talk in more detail about what the program, the, the specifics about the program. But as I said, it's, it's bail reform. It's another way to sort of help folks that have gotten involved in the criminal justice system. In the Bronx, uh, one of the sort of uh, there's a lot of very poor people. So even $500, $1,000, uh, asking folks to come up with that instead of getting on the bus and going to Rikers Island, the big city jail, uh, we, we'll assess them before arraignments and we'll figure out whether or not they can be part of uh, our supervised release program. Um, so we've been operating for about uh, a year and a half now, and as you can see, actually, here are some of the numbers here. So we've had, uh, in, the, in the Bronx, we, we've had 59% of our cases have been felony offenses. And that information is also in the oppressed packet, just if they wanted to look at it. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Maria. 40% um, of them are misdemeanors. 34%, uh, as you say, are, are, or as it shows, are uh, drug-related crimes. Others, uh, we get a lot of uh, petty larceny or theft, theft or larceny charges. Um, the ideas behind uh, this are to use in a way that we can uh, the, the, the arraignment and the arrest and arraignment uh, to provide sort of more humanistic approaches for folks that need to be that have needs clearly, um, and the uh, and all of this is an effort to, well, part of this is an effort to reduce the number of folks on Rikers Island. You may have seen it if you follow any news coming out of New York City. The mayor back in June uh, announced uh, as part of a commission to close Rikers. <clears throat> so there's. I think before the supervised release program started, there were roughly 10,000 inmates on Rikers Island. Now they think there's a little less than 8,000 and largely due to the supervised release programs. It really doesn't need to be folks who commit minor crimes who are not threats to the community uh, to languish on Rikers Island. As you can imagine, the, the ripple effect if somebody is removed from their family, so they'll, they'll Rent's not paid. Kids aren't getting to school. Uh, jobs are lost. 
and on and on. Um, and so that um, is the reason behind that effort to reduce the number on Rikers Island and help those folks. So in addition to sort of getting them out of having to go to Rikers Island, uh, and Rosa will talk a little more detail about this, but we really push to get them services that they might, they might need. So if somebody gets arrested for uh, purchasing drugs, uh, we, and if they have a drug problem, uh, then we will push to help them with uh, getting into drug treatment as an alternative. Um, how I, just to a show of hands, who, who could drop $10,000 if you got arrested for something? Who could drop $10,000 at, at arraignment? I know I couldn't. Um, and so, you know, it really begs the question of whether or not the, that would require me or should require me to go on, on to Rikers Island. Um, it also, it, it essentially criminalizes the, the poor. And so the program is, is an effort to really level the playing field. You know, the rich guy comes in, he gets arrested for trying to purchase drugs, and he's, he's dropping the money I'll see at the next court hearing, Your Honor. And the poor guy is like, I, I can't get it, and what's going to happen? And so we want to, so as I say, level the playing field between the rich and the poor. Um, it, ultimately, the city is hoping to close Rikers and open smaller jails in each of the boroughs. Um, and that hopefully will be not just smaller, but more sort of effective use of the time that they can help folks post, uh, post jail. Um, I want to introduce uh, Tracy Page. And Tracy's going to talk a little bit about um, the court operation um, and who becomes eligible and how. Thank you for being here. Um, so my name is Tracy Page, and I am the Associate Director of Supervised Release um, at Bronx Criminal Court. And my role is to help facilitate um, the screening process. So we are the front lines. We are the first people that you know the attorneys see, that the clients possibly see, that the judges see, where we are looking for those cases where we can help people if they're eligible to be released into our program. So our first. Um, process is that we gain a calendar. We can take nonviolent felonies, so we look for those nonviolent felonies. And once we locate them, we go to the defense attorneys, ask them if, they're, if they are interested in my program. If they say yes, we will do a screening process. And the city created a screening tool that determines eligibility. So we're looking at a person's rap sheet, criminal history, um, how many felonies they have, misdemeanors, their last warrant, um, meaning that they didn't come back to court. Um, if they have full-time activity. So if you have a job or not and it's full-time, it, it determines your stability in life, and the city is looking at that. And so in the Bronx, like you know, John said, most of our clients do not. And so that can be the, the factor of being eligible or not. Um, once I do this, we do this, the, the, the tool, if the person's eligible, then I will move forward with the, the attorney's permission to do an interview with the person. And so as you heard from the video, and the, the person said about you know that trying to get in touch with his mother and her not answering at first, one of our processes is that we have to be able to verify community ties. Because when we go in front of the judge, we want to tell the judge that we have someone who can vouch for that person, so we can get in contact with that person, and that we believe this is a good candidate to be released. So our advocating for someone actually determines whether sometimes they will be released or not, even just without our program. So all of our processes are very important because we're changing someone's life. So in the interview, we're explaining our program, what is required of them. They will be connected to a social worker if they have any, if they need any help with anything for social services. Um, we can connect them to that. Um, we explain to them that they have to come into our office for face-to-face -face meetings to make phone calls, um, and just the benefit of the program as an, another option when they go in front of the judge. Most people um, in the back where they're being held have two options: bail or to be released we're giving a third option to those felony cases. And, it's, and it's, it's a big deal. If they agree, we explain that there will be a contract that they will sign with the judge, not with us, with the judge, if the judge agrees. And it states that they have to avoid being rearrested, make all of their court appearances, and stay in touch with their social worker. And when they're done with the case, they're done with the program. If all of that aligns, we'll go in front of the judge. And if the judge agrees to hearing us speak on the record, to put our program as that another option, then we will advocate. 
and we would explain to the judge that we verified the community ties, this person will be a good candidate, we can help them and connect to services, and that we're willing to work with that person, and we have a contract ready if the judge agrees. If the judge agrees, they sign the contract, and then we walk them over to our office where they do an intake process and then connect to a social worker. So it's, that's like a small rundown, but it's, it's a very sometimes drawn out process because if I can't get in touch with the community tie, that person is sitting in the back and waiting, and they don't know what's going on. And they may only have that one number of someone they can remember. So who can remember a number, right? Like everything's stored in your phones. So if I told you right now, you each have to give me a phone number for you to be released out of this room today. Can you give me a number? Someone's going to pick up the phone right now. I'd call 911. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you can imagine the stress, number one, of being arrested. Number two, of being in the back for a day or two, scared. You're by yourself. You have no money. You don't remember any numbers. And I'm coming back there to tell you, I can help you if you give me one number to call for someone to say, yes, I'll vouch for you. You know, so it's not an easy situation to be in. So until you're in that situation, you know how dire and how desperate you'll be. So what we do each day, day in and day out, is we try to help people. You know, we're trying to save someone's life, because sometimes that's what it is. We are very passionate about our population that we serve. Um, every day we go above and beyond. We'll Google, you know, addresses to find some, a number. Um, we've done Facebook, you know, we'll email. You know, we do anything and everything we can do to try to help that person to remember a number or to reach out to someone who would know that person. And after all that, the person is released, and we've had great success in terms of coming back to court, making the court dates, getting the help that they need, being that we have such a a population that is kind of overlooked a lot. Um, and we are just a sanctuary for the community. So I just thank you all for being here um, and hearing our side of that little piece that we're trying to do for the Bronx. So thank you. Um, when, when Tracy says, uh, we work day and night, it sounds like a cliche. Mm. In fact, they're in the court 18 hours a day. Arraignments run. Uh, seven days a week. Uh, somebody gets arrested in New York State, by law, you have to see a judge within 24 hours of your arrest. And so that requires people arrested on a Sunday morning to see somebody, or to see a judge uh, by, b before the end. Um, and so, they, so we have weekend covered. So as you, as you might imagine, um, Monday morning when the, the case managers show up for cases that have come in Friday night till uh, Monday morning, we have a very busy calendar of new clients that are in, in the program. A lot of them actually, a lot of the folks, you know, clearly if, you're, if bail is, a, is part of the discussion, it means that you have some prior criminal record. Um, and so a lot of the folks that come through our program are on probation or are on parole. So uh, the difference, of course, probation, you, you're probably at some point maybe on, on Rikers Island or uh, at risk, high risk of going to Rikers Island for some prior problem. And for state parole, it means that you've served time in, in prison upstate, in one of the, the 70-something prisons that are in New York State. And so you're, you're supervised after your release from state prison. And so uh, we get sort of a mixed review from the probation and parole officers. Uh, many of them are very angry that their, their, their work, you know, the person in their program who's on probation has been rearrested. And so, as, as Tracy said, we, we do advocate for folks, and so that might include contacting the parole officer, contacting the probation officer, and say, actually, you should thank us because we are going to also watch over the, your, your probationer, your parolee. Um, some, and sometimes the, the parolee or the probation officer or parole officer will agree to allow them to, to remain in custody or remain in the community. Um, and sometimes because it's a violation of both probation and parole, a new arrest is, uh, they might not allow them the opportunity. Um, and sometimes it's the nuance of what, ha what they got arrested for and, um, and, you know, if it's a turnstile jump, it's very different from, uh, you know, selling, a, you know, a pound of heroin or whatever. So a lot of them have to sort of take a look at the, at the, the history of their success with probation or parole, uh, but they generally, 
like the fact that we're involved in the program and we collaborate with them. If there's any problems, I can't get a hold of him on the phone. He was supposed to come in today for his, his check-in. Uh, and if he doesn't, then we will call the probation officer parole. If you've seen him, what, what's going on? And then together, we'll try and get them back into the, the two programs. Um, I'm going to move now and ask uh, uh, Rosa Aguirre, uh, who uh, is, uh, helps us with case management, uh, to come up and talk a little bit. Um, Rosa, I've got some questions for you. <laughs> um, what, what, talk about what supervision for, uh, in, through the supervised release program entails in terms of levels, uh, risk, and responsivity. I'm sorry. So when the clients come to see us, like John said, a lot of the clients may have been in probation or parole. So we, when they come to see the social worker because they have finished with doing the intake, that's one phase. Then there's the part where they have to meet the social worker. We provide them an overview about what supervised release is. So we go over the contract, like the young man on the video was saying, and we tell them these are the rules and and you know, this is what a violation is, this is not a violation. You must always provide us a community tie, a phone number. And, um, and then after that, we our supervision model follows the risk needs responsivity research, which basically means that um, we monitor based on the risk to reoffend and the need. So what does that mean? Um, for example, and this is, I know it because well, my background is clinical psychology, so I can, for me to make that clear, I have to go into the clinical side. Um, so for example, you have a, a person that is use marijuana, right? They use marijuana. And you have another person that is a heroin addict. Ideally, you don't want to put the two people in the same group for counseling, right? Because they're going to learn from each other. Well, actually, the person smoking marijuana is going to learn about how to use heroin. So you don't want to do that. So similarly, when with our levels, we want to make sure we do a needs assessment to uh, prescribe the correct level of supervision. And we have four levels of supervision. We have level one, which is the lowest level of supervision, which is basically once a month face-to-face -face contact. So that means that they come to check in with the social worker once a month. Then there's level two. That means two phone calls and a one face-to-face -face visit. So they come, so basically the social worker calls them every other week and they come see us once a month. Then there's level three. That's basically one phone call a week and a face-to-face -face contact the following. So twice a month they come to our office. Then there's a level four. That is the highest level of supervision, which basically means one, one phone call in the beginning of the week and one face-to-face -face contact at the end of the week. So essentially, they're coming every week to our office to check in. Um, and so those are the four levels. Um, and because one of the goals of the supervised release program is that the client has to be, go back to court, that the goal, whole goal is they have to show up to court. So one of the things that we do, and it's part of their supervision, is we always send court reminders. We either call them and say, hey, Bob, you have court tomorrow, don't forget, or we text them at their number. And that's basically our levels of supervision. And um, our needs assessment is, is a way for us to assess need, like I said, risk and need. And the needs assessment basically gives us an area of where we can help the client um, in terms of housing, uh, mental health, counseling, like you saw before um, the young man Ishmael was talking about. Um, so that's that. I mean, do you want to? Well, you know, I would, I'm going to ask a, like, you guys a question. Um, based on what you've heard so far, what would you imagine that the folks that are in our program, what, what, are, their, what, what are some of their needs uh, in, that, they, that they present to us, ideas? You heard about drug addiction is one. Other? Affordable counseling. Affordable counseling, okay. So psychological counseling, and, right, 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 exactly. Other, uh, other ideas? Work, employment, excellent. Yes, very true. We have a lot of folks who are unemployed, and when they're not working, they 
are more likely to get into trouble and, and the rent's not getting paid. Uh, other, other ideas? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, the other one that often is overlooked is the degree of trauma that people have been exposed to in their lives, and we really can't minimize this at all. You know, I always give the example when we're doing sort of our initial assessment with, uh, with the new uh, members of our, of our program. Um, we ask questions about, have you had difficulty sleeping? Do you have recurring thoughts, et cetera? And virtually all the time I hear, especially from the guys who have actually veterans who have come in, obviously they're the most ones that post-traumatic stress disorder is, is often identified with a soldier that drops to, his, to the ground because of the car backfires, you know, on the streets in Brooklyn, uh, who's clearly been affected by his, uh, his, the war that he was uh, involved with, but also folks that are coming out of the state prison system. They see things in the state prison system. So if a guy comes in, he's been in the prison system for you know, any amount of time. Uh, it's always over a year, but they've also, they've been exposed to what happened, the theatrics from the other inmates, the, you know, the risk of violence in, in, in the prison system. The correction officers who are not often, you know, treating folks like, you know, Boy Scouts should. Uh, there's a lot of violence that goes on, uh, both from the authorities and from the folks that they're uh, incarcerated with. And so a lot of them, as you said, need psychological help. And so we will, we will help them find a place that they will get to uh, for that kind of psychological assistance. Um, and it's, you know, it's an important part of our work with them is really sort of identifying early on in our work uh, what their needs are so that we can start to figure out. And your, your example of, of work, you, you were spot on. So many of them just need jobs. Um, Um, question for Rosa: What what happens if someone is rearrested? Um, so just to add to the last reference that um, John was talking about, um, just so that we can get a little bit more, like you guys all hit it on in terms of like the needs of the clients being housing, being um, being uh, substance abuse counseling. Um, just to give you a little bit of a description of our people that work with me, the case manager, they're actually trained in motivational interviewing. And they all have social work degrees. So they are very client-centered. And, and just like John said, we really go out of our way to help the client. Um, we have gift cards that we provide the clients to, um, you know, to motivate them to return and tell them, hey, you did a great job. Here's a gift card, $10. Something for them. Um, I often see John telling them, "Well, you can get a McDonald's meal, a uh, twenty-dollar meal. You'll get ten dollars. You know, you just add ten more dollars and you use that gift card for ten. So um, that's one thing. We have care kits for our clients that are homeless, um, which helps them with their hygiene. But we don't call it like that. We call them care kits because you know we don't want the clients to feel uncomfortable of their, of their state that they're at." Um, we also give them Metro cards because guess what? That's two dollars seventy-five. Uh, as you saw on that thing, um, you can be charged for a theft of services if you go down the, in, the, in New York City and you use a turnstile and you jump over it. That's actually that can be a felony. So we help our clients with a Metro card in order for that not to happen. Um, so because of that. Um, we try to we tried our best to help our clients avoid rearrest, essentially. Um, and so, before talking about rearrest, um, at the court appearance, like I mentioned before, the we also write a compliance memo. So we let the court know and the district attorney's office know in court that the client is in compliance. These are for the clients that are following through and following the, our policies and not getting rearrested. We let the court know that, hey, they're doing great. And many times the judges will read the letter in court and tell the client, hey, good job. I just got your letter from supervised release. I hear you're doing great. And the clients end up feeling good about that too. So it makes it empowers them. Um, but not everything goes great, right? So sometimes sometimes our clients do get rearrested. Maybe they steal milk and they get charged with a petty larceny. 
uh, which actually I had to a client still, you know, and he did get charged with petty larceny. <laughs> so, um, and when that happens, um, we un- we have to inform the court. So we gotta let the uh, we do a rearrest notification and we inform the court, and that is considered a violation of supervised release or non-compliance. And so that's a violation. If our clients miss an appointment with us, a check-in within 48 hours, we also have to inform the court. So what happens next? What do you think happens once we inform the court that a violation happened, that they didn't follow through? What do you guys think happens? There'll be a warrant or summons from the court. Yes, that's a possibility. Can you, is there any sense that you can give uh, extenuating circumstances. I mean, that sounds like mm-hmm. Les Zapab, the guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In other words, you assess the severity of the violation. Which is actually, I like what you just said, because sometimes our social workers actually go to court. Mm-hmm. So even though we are bringing a re-arrest notification, sometimes we will go to court to let them know, hey, there was something else happening. Maybe they need benefit services, which who someone mentioned today, or maybe they need a connection so they can get their public assistance money, and you know this can help the client out. So a rearrest, just like you mentioned, it can be a way for us to connect better with the client and give them other services that they may need. And we often advocate and bring this to the judge and the DAs, so they get to hear it from us too. So there, there is a moment where we can continue to work with them and offer other services. So that's another option. The other thing uh, is that you know every court hearing is is a some negotiation that goes on. So one of the, one of the things we do is we might negotiate with the judge, Your Honor, if you agree to release this person, we'll increase their level of supervision. And so you know the client, of course, is I'll take I'll do whatever it takes to not have to go to Rikers Island. Thank you. Um, and so we might move them from a level two to a level three, which is you know just much more attention. Um, and then if they don't show up, then, you know, we will follow through with a notice of noncompliance. But we do, you know, as, as Tracy said, that, that contact with somebody else in the community, you know, how many times we've reached out to, you know, uh, an ex-wife, where, do you know where he might be, or a girlfriend, or a boyfriend, do you know where they might be so that we can get them back? And the threat of going to Rikers Island is often, you know, generates an immediate response, and we'll see them later that day or the next morning in our office. Um, I'd like to introduce Jamal Anderson, um, who uh, we can talk about the program all we like, but this man has actually been through the program. Uh, so, Jamal, I have a, a couple of questions for you. So, tell me how how it is that you first learned about uh, and joined the supervised release program. All right, well, hello, everybody. Uh, I was arrested. Um, it was for, like they were talking about earlier, um, basically hopping the train, you know, not, not paying the fare for the train or whatnot. Um, they have a, a thing where they, uh, they can take a metro car that has nothing on it and, and bend it, and you can use it to get on the train. It'll work. So... Um, there's plenty of times where, you know, people get in situations and you don't have any money and now they're like, you know, I could just take all these empty cards and I can get some money and I can do whatever I need to do. And these are situations that happens a lot. I was caught up in that also and I was arrested. And that's how I got to be assessed because I was I was basically, jail is, jail is a place that um, it, it, it spirals you. You know, when you go in, when you come out, it's like everything's like like the rent's not being paid. You know, your kids still want jobs are harder to get. You know, things happen, so it kind of sends you right back into doing the same things over and over. So um, that's basically how I got to know the program through that incident. And so you were accepted uh, at at arraignment. Before the arraignment, you were sort of you agreed to be part of the supervised release program. Um, tell me how that was different from other experiences you might have had at arraignments. Um, the experiences that I had with arraignments, I was already in the frame of mind like, look, I don't even care. I'm going to jail for for something simple. Like I'm, 
I was I was spiraling already. I was like, whatever. They came, they was like, oh, we can help you. You know, we'll take you to this, this program. I'm like, you know, whatever. I didn't really have too much confidence in it. I never heard of it. I, I'm just like, whatever. And um, it, it, it turned out that in front of the judge, they came in and they spoke with the judge and told him, you know, this is the program we're gonna put him in and we'll supervise him. And they let me out. And when that happened, then I was surprised. I was very surprised um, and thankful. I was thankful, I was surprised. It kind of lifted, you know, my spiral just for a brief moment, a brief moment. Yeah. Um, and I think that's actually one of the recurring themes here appreciation that is shown to us by everyone that comes into the supervised release program. Because like Jamal, they often have been through the process again and again, uh, multiple arrests and multiple, you know, what, what they call in, 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 in New York, these skid bids, these short-term, uh, you know, sentences to Rikers Island. So it's, it's less than a year if you're sentenced to Rikers, uh, but, you know, even a month, three months, six months, eight months in Rikers Island, to not have to do that because of the supervised release program, uh, they come out and they're like, you know, ready to give this total stranger a hug, thank you for getting me out. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And um, follow through with what other things, that, so you were in the supervised release program from March, actually you were in, you started in our program within the first week, this is, this is March of 2016, mm -hmm. I think. So March 3rd. You were, you were one of our earliest uh, members. Mm -hmm. uh, but sort of walk me through uh, that process until that in, until the outcome of your case months later. Okay. Was um, it a smooth, uh, smooth journey? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't so smooth because um, after, I, after I got into the program and I came out, you know, I came out back to my life. And uh, my life was, it was a little kind of in shambles. Um, I had my own place. Um, I was in a basement. I got that place because I, I, I met the owner of the house and I did some work for him. He knew I didn't have a place. He needed some money, he gave me a place to stay. Staying in the basement, boiler, everything. Um, I was giving him like $200, you know, and I was doing a lot of work for him around the house. So that was, it was somewhere to stay. My kids couldn't come over there because, you know, stuff like that. Um, I wasn't working. Um, every job, every time I go to get a good job, like it'll come up like, oh, you, you hopped the train in 2006 or the cop spells your name wrong right here. So that's, that's an alias. You didn't say anything about that. I wouldn't get the job. So, you know, the search continues. I'm, I'm out here running around trying to pay rent, trying to, you know, feed children, trying to do what I have to do for myself. And um, the program, this man here, John, was was actually my um my counselor. Every time I would go see him, you know, like he would say things that I'd be like, "Why? Like, what is what? I don't understand. Like, how you believe in me so much? You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I don't even believe in myself right now. But um, they help me out a lot. Excuse me. <sighs> um, yeah. So I got a job. Got a job. I was doing security. Everything was going great. And uh, the security company, you know, um, they were supposed to pay on Friday. I was waiting for that check. I didn't have no money. Friday came. They didn't pay me. So now I'm like, uh, I'm supposed to go to work the next day. I don't have no money. I still had a, I got to work. I need the money. So I hopped the train. <laughs> so I had to go to work. Got arrested. Spiral. That's it. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Um, somehow, we got in touch with 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 John over here, and surprisingly, again, you know, when I got to the court, he was there. He was like, I'm like, he's there. Like that's 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 weird. You know, he's talking to the judge. He's telling him, you know, they that he'll vouch for me and whatnot. And once again, they let me go. So. Words don't describe it, you know, but that helped out a lot. And um, I don't know, without that, I don't know where I'd be right now. 
So I feel like I owe them a lot. And um, it was pretty smooth after that, though, you know, because I kept whatever's happening, I just kept like, look, I can't have the train. I can't, you know what I'm saying? I can't do it. I got, look, I'm going to have to walk. I end up walking a lot, you know, stuff like that. And, um, you know, things are still hard. But even like um, last week, I mean, I, I I spoke with John. I'm like, yeah, I'm working. I don't got no money in my pocket. He still helps me out, give me a gift card. Look, you want to eat? I use that to eat. You know, like it's it's a great help. It's a great help. Help me out psychologically. Help me out, um, period. So that's that was basically my ride. And what what happened on the the first case? How was the case resolved? Um, they gave me ten days community service. With that, um, they gave me uh, a misdemeanor for possessing a forged instrument, which was a metro card that had a little bend in it to get on the train. So now jobs look at me like, hey, you know what? Forgery. It's terrible. No, you know. But um, that's what they gave me. I had to work that out, 10 days community service. I was working 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. Only days I had that I could do it was Saturday and Sunday. So I basically did two, two and a half months working seven days a week and I uh, completed that and um, everything was basically satisfactory. There, there was a issue where they didn't give me credit for one or two days and they wanted me to do that again. I said, look, you know, there was, there's always issues that come up that make you, you know, turn back. But I didn't turn back. I stayed on it, told John about it, you know, everything worked out and, um, then they that I was done with the program. I, I graduated. Mm -hmm. yes, exactly. um, you're an inspiration to me, by the way, just because of despite challenge after challenge. I mean, you have had a whole different life than I have, certainly, but sort of poverty has been a recurring theme in your life, and yet you've never said, I surrender. Um, and so that actually inspires all of us to, to do that. So it's, it's a tribute to you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Tracy, a question about program sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. Tell us about some of the challenges. Um, some of the challenges of this of this program, Supervisor Release, is I guess the biggest one: public safety, mm -hmm. right? Because we are releasing people um, that may have otherwise, you know, had bail set and gone to Rikers Island, and some of these charges that we take, not the felony ones, but the misdemeanors, can be considered violent in terms of like assault right so let's say someone you know you have a fight with someone in the street and then you get arrested that's a misdemeanor assault charge um there could be an order of protection out against that person and you may be tempted to go back and you know find that person so you know one of the ways that we're combating public safety or helping public safety is just by only taking people with non-violent felonies which are the more serious ones so uh, burglary in the first or second degree, robbery, obviously murder, you know, just things like that um, where we are mindful of people being safe and also having a connection to a social worker who can help if they have any underlying issues. Um, also, a challenge is the unpredictability of human behavior. You know, we, we can advocate on someone's behalf, but we have no idea what that person is going to do. All we can do is give them a chance because we all deserve a chance, right? And um, just us being a diversion is our main goal, just to be diverted towards Rikers Island. And once we give them that opportunity, then we set them up to have a social worker that they can hopefully get the, service, the help that they need. Um, but ultimately, we really just, we have no idea what's gonna happen, but it's not up to us to determine whether someone deserves to be released or not. All we are doing is giving the option and then allowing life to happen, but giving the tools to succeed. Um, are there younger younger folks in the supervised release program? How do they? How do they? What's the scoring like for them versus a, a guy my age? Yes. So thank you, John. Um, so the the city uh, 
people between the ages of 16 to 19 are considered a higher risk, just in terms of reoffending, getting rearrested for similar charges, more violent charges, just in terms of the community they live in, the crowds they hang around, you know, being in school and peer pressure and things like that. Um, so a lot of times they're not eligible for the program just because of the scoring that the city created, I said about the risk assessment tool. Um, so, but if we do get those younger people, we are trying to help them much more and it's much more important to get those community ties, like a mother or father involved, where we can have someone who's strongly with them, living with that person, that can help. But that is one of the challenges, not being able to help people who probably need it the most, which are the younger kids. Um, whereas someone who's 40 and over, who could have had 50 arrests, would be eligible. Whereas someone who's 16, and this is your second arrest, you may not be eligible. So it just depends on the, the scoring level of it. Um, and we again, we have no control over that just because the city wants to be unbiased across all five boroughs. Uh, one observation about that. Uh, you may recall the story of Khalif Bowler, who was uh, arrested for, I think it was second degree uh, stealing or second degree robbery. Uh, it was a book bag. Um, he ended up on Rikers Island, so he would not have been eligible for our program. One of the lessons, though, is for young people in particular to end up incarcerated, they're much more vulnerable. Psychologically, kids are often not prepared to deal with the kind of trauma that they witness on. And this uh, young man, Khalif, is the sort of a, a classic story of a kid that was incarcerated for, I, I think, at least many months, uh, if not a year, on Rikers. And he ended up uh, getting out of Rikers and struggled psychologically, and ultimately he ended up killing himself. Uh, and it was a lesson for all of us, I think, including folks uh, in the criminal justice system about the vulnerability of young people and the importance of programs like supervised release. Um, I want to see, uh, we only have a few more minutes left, but I want to see if anyone has any questions about, uh, about the program um, or what we do. Yes? Uh, touching on kind of the risk assessment tool mm -hmm. and what's happening with supervised release, as the whole country now is grappling with money bail and moving away from money bail, uh, and looking to programs like you all and other places, there's pretrial services and pretrial supervision kind of leading the way. Um, where do you see risk assessment tools uh, coming into play? Uh, it, it sounds certainly like the tool you all are using presents hurdles and barriers for mm -hmm. folks, particularly the employment is really concerning to me. Um, so uh, where do you see that tool coming in? Do you see it as, a, as an asset? Do you see it as a barrier? Um, would you like to see tools reformed in some way or tweaked in various ways? Yeah, yeah. It's an excellent question. Uh, I think the, um, you know, just from my perspective, I think the city is going to learn f about the effectiveness of the, or the accuracy, I should say, of these, uh, the assessment tool. Um, as the folks here have talked about, can we include some people who might have some violent offenses? What about some dis district, uh, district uh, domestic violence uh, situations? Uh, you know, obviously uh, high risk, uh, but, but there are ways for us to supervise folks who might be in the community. New Jersey's had a program of supervised release, and it was a big uh, news piece, uh, at least up in New York City, about the troubles that they've had because they have released folks uh, with violent offenses who have actually gone on and, uh, you know, committed other violent crimes. Um, and so, you know, the parent of a child who was killed as a result of somebody being released, you know, that, that makes you sort of gives you pause about who you want to be, who you want in the program and to the degree in which you can increase the likelihood that they will, you know, continue in life crime free and, and especially violent free uh, lives. And so I think, I think it's a, it's a, you know, it will get better over time um, and I think the tool will get a little more uh, fine tuned in terms of who, who they can assess. Maria? Want to add to this? Yeah, just a little bit. Um, Maria Almonte Weston, I'm the project director for Bronx Community Solutions. So just recently, uh, uh, 
the criminal justice agency, which is um, the agency that New York City utilizes to actually um, do a assessment to, to see if someone qualifies to be released on their own recognizance, um, is undergoing, I think it's gonna be a year long research evaluation project to reimagine a better assessment tool because of the same kinds of concerns that you brought up that many have brought up, um, especially when you're talking about somebody's freedom in three seconds and an attorney um, has no faith in the tool that is making that decision. So I think that we're at a place now where the city um, and policy is really changing so that the assessment tool doesn't become the only thing that is mentioned or the only thing that the decision is based on, but that it actually ha has a guidance that is a lot better and more effective than some of what we've already seen. Uh, other questions? We're looking to hire some new social workers, so I'm just wondering is anyone <laughs> looking? The caseloads, unfortunately, are uh, very high right now. The program over the last year and a half has become very popular. Certain defense attorneys, you know, instead of a guy going to jail, hey, yeah, how about supervised release? You know, they're, you know, virtually everyone they want to uh, refer to us. Uh, so it's helpful to have the tool to sort of narrow it down as to who's appropriate. You had another question? Yeah, I'm just interested if you've seen any changes um, in case outcomes after participation or have been more inclined to say dismiss charges or reduce charges, and have you seen Mm -hmm. uh, excellent 12 questions right there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's no question that, uh, you know, these are generally low-level crimes, um, and so the district attorney doesn't want to have to take the case to trial. And so, and I say this to all the guys that come into the program early on, if you follow the supervised release guidelines, typically what they will do is reduce the felony case to a misdemeanor with a, an, a, through your attorney, maybe with 10 days of community service, um, or a misdemeanor is reduced to a violation. Um, and so there, there are you know, very concrete reasons why someone wants to stay in our program. Um, so uh, there are better outcomes. Uh, what, does it affect uh, sort of future criminal behavior? Uh, it does if, people take advantage of the services of, you know, sort of the, you know, again, you know, purchasing drugs is, uh, you know, is a, that's, a, that's a sign that there's a problem. And if somebody takes advantage of it, now we do it on a voluntary basis because we don't want to attach to the court because that's sort of a different angle. But we do a lot of work, and Rosa in particular is very good about this, helping people get into treatment, consider treatment as, an alter, as because that's what they need. Uh, how do you, how, why did you lose your job? Uh, you, you were getting high still. How can we help you sort of discontinue that, that approach? And I, I never want to minimize the power of addiction, um, but if people consider treatment and know that we believe that they can change, uh, I think psychologically, I think it helps a lot of people, like uh, Jamal you know, mentioned. You know, he's, he's come a long way since I met him a year and a half ago, and uh, you know, it's a tribute to him, but it's... Uh, it's work, and so you have to really sort of, you know, focus on what got you in the situation and how can you, how can we help you to not repeat those mistakes you've made in the past. Getting jobs has been huge. We have a, we've actually got a great job developer that works at the court program now, and virtually everybody that comes through that doesn't have a job meets with him, and he's actually not just tuning up resumes. He's helping people with mock interviews. He's helping, he knows where resources are. It's actually a good time to look for a job in New York City. And so he, he helps guys get at least their foot in the door on some new jobs. So that will change behavior as well. Um, but, you know, there's no magic bullet for any of this. Uh, but we, we agree to work with somebody to consider all the options. And I think that's really what the, the beauty is in terms of the voluntary services we use. Yes? So we, with regard to uh, finding employment, um, are, are any people uh, candidates for some kind of a vocational training? And is it possible for you to uh, 
direct them to where such training could be uh, obtained? Yes, absolutely. I, I should have mentioned that. So we not only is it jobs, but we also get guys that, you know, well, I only went as far as 10th grade. I really wish I finished high school. Did you take the GED? We've got a program that can train you for, for your GED. Uh, you want, what, what is your career goal right? instead of your just next job goal? We try and hook, hook them up with some, some agencies in New York City that sort of focus on bigger picture, uh, you know, job, uh, you know, options down the road. So it includes getting kids, uh, young people into, to, into schools, getting them back into high school, um, and getting in some vocational training programs as well. I mean, we'll consider any option that we think is a, is a positive step forward for them. Yeah, good question, though. Yes? Um, you keep saying guys. Guys, oh, no, uh, good, yeah. yes. Yeah. I, well, I say guys sort of as a generic, um, give a sense men of and women, you're, yes. Okay, but, but is, is the percentage much more for men? Yes. And for women, are there specifically other problems that you help with? Um, it, I mean, it's all the same. I mean, we, you know, it's whatever they come into our program, whatever help that they need, we're going to provide it. Doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, just whatever you're presenting to us. So we ask you, what do you need help with? What can, what can we do for you? How can I help you so that you don't come back here and get rearrested? That's our conversation that we're having. And then whatever they say they need help with, we will help them. But we do get more um, men um, than women. That is true. Also, in your press packet, there is some data specifically that you could refer to about. Um, both the um, breakdown of all of our clients. Uh, Bronx Community Solutions is just one of five providers in the city. Um, three of, uh, two others of which are part of our organization, uh, Brooklyn Justice Initiative and Staten Island. Uh, but for the overall general uh, demographic breakdown, uh, our population, it's about 81 to 85% male to answer your question. And what we've seen that for supervised release, um, it's actually a less percentage for females. So they're um, lower than, uh, I think, what, 15 or 14% of our population that is into um, our services right now. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, you. As Maria mentioned, the press packets are good because it also shows you the success rate that we've had. No new felony arrests, very high percentage of folks that do not get rearrested for felonies. So it sort of answers your question uh, later. Uh, it's close to, you know, it's high 80s in terms of uh, success for no new felony arrests. So we, we like to pat ourselves on the back with that as well. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah.